if you're still with us on the BBC News channel, I hope you are, we're going to continue with our programme. A hundred years ago, the Royal Army chaplains were recognised for their outstanding service and sacrifice during the First World War, and we're, they were then called royal by King George V. And on Friday, Her Majesty the Queen attended a service at Wellington Barracks to mark the centenary. We're joined now by Padre Tom Heine, a chaplain of five years, who was at the commemoration. Thank you very much for being with us here this morning. Thank you. How was it? What was the format on Friday? Oh, it was a it was sort of standard military service. There's a professional choir at the Guards Chapel, so it sounded beautiful. There's a bit of sun and lots of lucky tourists who were sort of crowded mm. outside to see the Queen. And it was amazing, really. I mean, you have 500 people, some of whom are prepared to um, and trained and built up to go to war. And then the Queen arrives, the tiniest and oldest person among us, but everybody absolutely in awe of her. Yeah. Mm. And could you think what some of those uh, men and women will have seen during their time in service as well? Tell us a little bit about the role of the army chaplain then, because you're not there simply as a spiritual guide, are you? Your, your function is much broader than that. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're known as a padre, which is an old Portuguese, well, it's a Portuguese word for father. And you do actually end up playing sort of father uh, or mother to them a lot of the time. It's a pastoral role. Uh, the army is a cross section of society. They have all the sort of relationship and financial problems that anybody else gets themselves into. And uh, some of the time you're simply helping them deal with that. Um, yeah, back in World War One, it would have been slightly different, a lot more burials, a lot more sort of services. And doing some sort of quite gruesome things like uh, Padres would often spend the night with someone who was going to get hung for wow. desertion or shot for desertion rather. And um, yeah. It's gruelling, but also it must be gruelling now, but in a very different way. You're sort of built for those awkward moments, you know, in A&E and um, on the sofa with, with a sort of family who, who are going through bereavement. Um, we're often quite awkward people in everyday situations, but when it comes to sort of intense moments, we, we sometimes come into our own. Mm, that's yeah. where the training comes in. But what about the actual um, forces training as well? Because presumably you are going out to combat areas so you need a certain level of physical training as any member of the armed forces there will be there will be some sort of older soldiers watching who will be smirking because there, there have been <laughs> some quite chubby padres uh, these, ah. these days there is an emphasis on that on that side of being professionally sort of ready and fit and strong yeah. um, while trying not to become too military because you want to have that sort of separation. detached mm. separation um, this job is in your family though isn't it Yes, yeah, so dad, uh, dad was a padre, um, and I grew up. I, I mean, I, I, I never thought that I'd go into the. You can see the resemblance. Wow. Yeah. Um, Great picture. There he is. Yeah. Um, and he, he ended up as, as chaplain to the Chelsea pensioners. Uh, so he, oh. yeah, I, I grew up with that. But I, I mean, I never thought I'd end up in the church, let alone in the army. But uh, here so we how are. How did you? Well, I was a journalist actually, and um, worked in London, and then was in South Africa for nine years and the gorgeous township gospel music eventually sort of melted me. I, I used to go and do stories about that and then eventually just stayed. And that's yeah. what happened. Yeah. Do you find that um, men and women come to you even if they don't have any kind of firm religious belief? Yeah, uh, soldiers are very intuitive creatures. They might not have sort of like stacks of uh, A-levels and, and degrees, but they, they know who they trust and they know who they like. And yes, regardless of, of, of where they are, if they think you care and if they think that, that you won't judge them and will help them, they, they come towards you. You often, as a chaplain, spend the first two or three months in a regiment winning that trust um, before you can be effective. And also, I imagine now that you're not, it's not just men and women you're looking after, but also you're looking after people with many different faiths and, as Rachel mentioned, no faith at all. Yeah, indeed. I mean, there's, that's part of a, there's a national conversation about our relationship with, with God, with our Christian heritage and that conversation is ongoing. I mean, I'm not a, ashamed to be a Christian, but uh, I wouldn't have much to do if I just restricted myself to church going soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. And um, where do you think the future lies for the roles of, of chaplain? Uh, as we see less active service, perhaps um, British Armed Forces being less engaged overseas. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, the army itself is, is sort of asking what the future of of warfare looks like as, uh, at the same time. So the role of chaplaincy is running parallel to that. There will be changes, probably. Some things don't change. Um, yeah. And also, I imagine um, some people 
who leave the army probably need you more at that point than they ever had before. Yeah, so in America, the veterans have their own padres. Well, we don't have yeah. that set up here, but that could be a development. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. It seems to make sense. Well, thank you very much for coming in. No, thank you. This morning, it's greatly appreciated. My pleasure.